Leanna, take it away. All right. Oh, thanks, Nicole. And thank you everyone for being here with us this morning. I am so thrilled to be here and to share a little bit about my own journey towards becoming an artist, as well as sharing about just my go-to tools, you know, getting down to the basics, like Nicole said, is really wonderful to do, even when you're an experienced artist sometimes. It's good to have that refresher to make sure, you know, to just evaluate where you are, maybe refresh your supplies a little bit. So we'll be going over my favorite brushes, paints, and papers. I'll be telling you a little bit about each one. And like Nicole said, please jump in with a question anytime. This is really just a casual session. In all honesty, I've got my yoga pants and slippers on <laughs> over here. So <laughs> we're keeping it real casual today. So um, I, we thought it'd be fun to start out with me just sharing a little of my backstory, um, just to let you all in a little bit on where I came from and you know how I got to where I am now um, before we jump into the tools. So like Nicole said, my name's Leanna Fisher. Um, I actually grew up here in Virginia and long winding story, moved away for nine years, but now I'm back in my hometown. So kind of a fun full circle thing. But for my, for my watercolor practice, um, going back to college, that is where I first learned watercolor. I went to school for architecture. Do we have any architects or designers here? Always curious. <laughs> it's a little unusual. Um, but anyway, it was a really great experience. And um, I took this random class and it was to learn how to paint buildings because you do that. Oh, we've got a landscape architect. Um, you do learn how to do presentational drawings, you know, in architecture. And so it was very um, structured and we really honed in on the, on the basics. And I just got a good understanding of how watercolor works. Uh, and I loved it. I loved it so much, <laughs> but it was an elective class. You know, I had no thoughts of taking it elsewhere after the class was over. So that was around 2008, 2009, you know, um, graduated during the recession. <laughs> there were no jobs. I had just a, a long season of what, what is next for me? Um, I even lived with my parents for a while, you know, before I got married. Um, and of course, architecture was my degree. That's what I got started in. So eventually did find a job and started in that. Um, there was always just this sense, like, I don't think this is what I'm supposed to be doing, but I don't know what else to do. <laughs> and it was, it was challenging because here I've spent five years learning how to do this, you know, and I didn't like it. <laughs> it's like, oh no. So I just kept thinking maybe if I find the right office, maybe a more creative firm will be a better fit, you know? So I kind of hopped around a little bit. Anyway, um, 2013, I got married and my husband and I moved to Arkansas about three months later for him to get a PhD. So I had left my architecture job to, to make that move. And suddenly I found myself with a little bit of open space in my schedule. You know, you know what it's like, you're working full time. There's just not much time for a whole lot else sometimes. And so I just, I hadn't painted for years, you know, at this point. Well, during that, that open space, I just kind of remembered my watercolors again. And I was looking for work in our new town, but I had this time and I just started painting again. And something sparked in me that was like, this is it. And I can't really explain it. It was just like this knowing, like, oh my gosh, painting is my thing. But of course, I didn't know the first thing of being an actual artist. <laughs> you know, I didn't know um, how to run a business. I mean, I wasn't even thinking about that at the beginning. It was more like, I just wanted to spend every minute I could painting. And that's really what I did. Um, I just, of course, before I started working again, I would paint for hours on end. Um, I did, of course, need to get a job eventually. And 
so I started, I started working full time again, but at that point I knew I have got to figure out how to make my artwork a big, a big part of my life. And so that was around 2013. Um, and it's really just that little by little story where I kept, um, I kept at it. <laughs> I just kept making art almost every day, even if it was like 20 or 30 minutes. And I opened a little tiny Etsy shop. Um, I attended a local craft show in our town. Um, and I started my newsletter with 15 people. <laughs> and that was back in 2014. Um, and so it just was this little, very slow progression of believing that I could be an artist and taking tiny, tiny actions towards that every day as much as I could. Um, and so in 2016, um, I had been working still in architecture up until that point. That was when I decided, okay, I think I can really make a go at this now. And I decided to go full time into my artwork. Um, and that included a lot of teaching. I taught pottery as well, kind of random fact. I, I also love to do pottery. And um, I taught at this local creative center for about six years there. That was a big part of what I did. But um, yeah, anyway, it's kind of just that sticking with it and also um, just trusting myself. I think it was like, I, um, I did a lot of diving into my personality and learning about myself. I, for years of my life, I honestly didn't really know how I ticked, I guess. And I started reading more about just personality types, understanding how I process things. I learned I'm a huge people pleaser and I was making a ton of decisions in my life just because it's like what I thought other people would want, <laughs> even being an architect, it really, and it all led me to where I am now and I don't regret any of it, but um, that was just a big part of my journey of, you know, embracing who I was and stepping into that, even when I wasn't sure where it was going to go. So anyway, um, here we are in 2023. Um, I'm still still loving my watercolors and am just uh, still amazed that I get to do this as a job. You know, um, I if you had told my 10 year old self like I'd get to be leading a workshop with you guys today, I would have just been like I would have fallen on the floor. So. Anyway, it's, um, it's really great to be here. So anyway, that is kind of my journey of coming to watercolor. Um, you know, the, the big things I learned along the way, kind of like I mentioned, understanding myself better helped me unlock, I think, what, what I was really meant to do. And then, um, just building tiny habits around my bigger goals of being a, an artist and sticking with that every day <laughs> is really what got me here. So um, yeah, there's of course like a million other things I could share, but that's the big picture overview. And um, yeah, I hope it's encouraging, you know, no matter what your goals are, um, it's, I think it's so important to to take them seriously and to listen to those things. Um, and, not, and not everything has to become your full-time job either. I'm actually um, <laughs> back into taking pottery lessons again. Even though I taught pottery, I'm really rusty. And I decided I'm going to take lessons again. I'm also learning piano. And I'm just like doing these little things that are just good for my soul. <laughs> and, um, you know, I'll never become like an actual potter, but I can just do it for fun. So anyway, that's my story. Are there any questions, anything else you'd like to know? I'm kind of an open book, to be honest, so. 
Thanks for sharing, Lana. It's great. It's great that you're doing, I think, the intention. We love this idea around feeding your soul with creativity. So mm. thank you for sharing all of that with us. It's 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 really lovely to get to know you on that level. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for listening. Well, um, for the rest of our class, I I want to do a deep dive into my actual tools and supplies that I use. And because this is recorded, you know, don't feel like you need to be taking notes, you know, voraciously. Um, you can always refer back to this. And after the workshop, Nicole, I didn't mention this, but I will send a full list of links to all the supplies that I mentioned here. So if there's anything, you know, you're like, oh, where do I get that? I'll have the whole list in an email for you. So, um, okay, let's start with brushes. I, um, gosh, there's so much I could say about all of these topics. And again, please jump in if you have any questions whatsoever. To give a really broad overview of brushes, I'll start by putting them into two categories. We have our soft brushes, which are usually made of a natural fiber like um, squirrel hair, usually some kind of animal um, hair. And then we have our synthetic brushes. Let's find one here. These are stiffer um, and these are made of synthetic fibers and there's different ranges of quality in all of them. Um, I use both, I use them for different things. Soft brushes are, or the natural brushes, they, they are more expensive, but um, they're not essential. I love them because the nice thing about a soft brush is it holds a lot of water. It can just travel across your page endlessly. <laughs> so it's really wonderful, especially for larger pieces, um, for filling large areas of your page. Having a nice, soft, absorbent brush is perfect for that. A synthetic brush, though, is wonderful in its own way because it holds its shape really, really well. So it's really good for precise lines. And um, I use these just as much for different techniques. So um, what I'll do is I actually can demonstrate really quickly here, um, just on some little test paper to just quickly show you the difference between these brushes. So this one here, this is a soft brush made of squirrel hair. And I use this one all the time. Now, if you can see, and I'm not sure the best place to hold this up is, Nicole, is the one with my hands the one that's yes. the best. Okay. Yes, great. that's great. Okay. So this one you can see it's got kind of a rounded shape to it and it just looks kind of like a big blob. <laughs> but once I put it in the water, it will absorb that water and it will actually start to form more of a pointed shape. So the nice thing is this is a round brush that is soft and it it holds a ton of water. So I'm just going to get a little paint on my brush and we'll, we'll get into paints more in a minute. But with this brush, really nice and loaded up, move some space here. I can just fill this, you know, a nice large section of my page very smoothly with a soft brush. A soft brush um, is less likely to cause streaks as you paint because those bristles are just so gentle on the paper. So that is, um, yeah, my soft brush. I use this if I'm filling in like, you know, the foreground of a painting, maybe it has a lot of grass. I'll do the whole area with this brush. Now the synthetic brush, here we are, and this is a flat brush. We'll get into that in a minute. The flat brush, it will do a very precise line and it's not gonna hold nearly as much paint. So I can be very precise, but I'm gonna have to reload this brush 
multiple times to continue on along the page there. So just different, different pros and cons to both. All right, now the shape of the brush, and we kind of touched on this already. This, like I said, is a round brush. And of course, um, all of these types of brushes come in all different sizes. One of my, this is my biggest brush. This is my big daddy. <laughs> uh, I don't even know what size, I think it's like a number 20. And it is, this is a natural brush. Um, it is just amazing. I can fill like an entire page of paper <laughs> with this brush. Um, but normally I'm using something closer to this size. And a round brush is great because it's very versatile. So like I showed you, I can fill this area like I did here, but I can also use it for line work. So I can do a pretty wide line with it, depending how hard I press, or I can do a pretty thin line with it, like so. And so I use round brushes for 90% of what I do. That it, this is kind of my go-to shape. But um, a flat brush is wonderful too. And I, I use different sizes of a flat brush as well. These are both synthetic. I also have a natural one here. And I love using these. Um, I do a fair number of house portraits and buildings and you know, more hardline elements. And so these are wonderful for that. So, you know, you can just really create nice crisp lines and you can paint with that side of the brush or you can use the edge to create thinner lines as well. One really cool trick with a flat brush is you can use it to remove pigment from the paper. And this can really come in handy for a, a few different things. But one is, let's say, um, you might be able to tell, like the bottom edge of this area here is a little jackety. Maybe I want to clean that up a little bit and make it more, more precise looking. I can just get water on my flat brush here. And I'm trying to sh like hold this up so you can see. If I wiggle that brush along the bottom edge of this area, I can actually kind of remove a little bit of pigment and just kind of clean up that bottom edge. So it's just a gentle rubbing, but because this is such a stiff brush, um, it really can lift up the paint. Um, I can even go into this whole this area here and lightly wiggle the brush and it will actually create little lines. And so this is one way to bring back the white of the paper in precise areas. If there's ever, you know, if you have maybe background trees or something that you wanna highlight, that's a thin line, you can do that with a flat brush. So. I use this little trick all the time. And it was years before I even knew it was a thing. <laughs> so I wanted to tell you about it because it really is helpful. All right. So that's kind of a quick brush overview. I, of course, also have much smaller brushes. Um, you know, these are great for detail. Um, I have, this is a big flat brush that I use um, if I'm stretching paper, which I'll talk about in a little bit, I can cover the whole page of my paper very quickly with a brush like this. So yeah, there's so much with brushes. The, the long and short of it is you really can't go too wrong with a brush. They just, um, it just depends what you're trying to do with it. So they each have wonderful qualities, but for example, I couldn't, um, well, I could, it just wouldn't turn out very well, <laughs> paint a large area of a paper with this brush, for example. So it just depends on what you're trying to do. Are there any questions about brushes? 
Okay. Leanna, I actually do have one just more so for uh, yeah. in case people have questions. If you were sure. to have a starter kit of maybe three or four brushes, what would you recommend? Oh, that's a great question, Nicole. Starter kit. Um, what I always include with the starter kit that I give my students is a um, just the round brushes usually. I do a number two, a six, and a 10. And those with those three brushes, you can paint almost anything you want to. I mean, within reason, but um, three brushes, a, all round, a two, a six, and a 10. Yeah, those are the ones that I, yeah, that I would recommend. And then you can just expand from there based on how you like to paint, what size you like to paint, you know, all of that. Yeah, great question. Um, okay, so that's a quick overview on brushes. Now let's get into paint. Paint is another topic that you could do a whole class on. Honestly, paint is so fascinating. Just the history of it, the way that it's made. Um, watercolor paint essentially is just ground up pigments with a binder, which is um, usually something called gum Arabic. Um, don't ask me like what that is. I think there's like honey involved. <laughs> I don't know a ton about it, but basically that just keeps the pigment particles together so that they can flow smoothly um, as you paint. So watercolor comes in pan sets like this one here. And this is where the paint is um, put into these little trays and it's just dry and you activate it with water. Super convenient. I, um, I use these all the time. And especially for starting out, this is definitely what I would recommend. They're usually very affordable. You can keep it in your desk at work even and just pull it out. Um, so actually I have the one that I started with here. This is a Windsor Newton Cotman set. It's like their student grade set. <laughs> you can tell it's very well loved. This is what I used for the first two years of my painting practice because it was just the one I had in college and I, you know, I just didn't have any money to spend on supplies. So I just used this and it lasted me a long time. It really did. So um, you don't have to be fancy when it comes to paint. It's, it's really the main thing is as long as it's a decent quality, um, you know, and you have a good range of primary and secondary colors, you're good to go. So I, um, I'll get into now what I use at this point. And this is where, you know, if you wanna get a little more serious with what you, with your painting practice, um, I would recommend investing in tube paint. Watercolor paint does also come in a tube and it's just a very concentrated um, pigment and it squirts out like that. And then you can fill a palette, an empty palette with your own paint. So this is my very messy palette. <laughs> um, I have just kind of always kept it in this way. There are much more precise ways to do this, <laughs> I'm sure you could YouTube how to make a watercolor palette. Um, but I love having a few different greens here. I keep those mixed up. Um, kind of my cools, my blues are down here. And then um, I have more painting specific colors here. So right now I'm doing some Valentine stuff. So I have some reds mixed up. It just depends on what I'm painting. But the wonderful thing is it's completely customizable. So you can squirt any combination of tubes into this and just mix to your heart's content. So, <laughs> um, Anna, sorry yeah. to interrupt. Yeah. There's just a couple questions in the chat I wanted us to oh, address thank before you, we Nicole. go too far. Yes, please. Sure. Um, so, Deborah asked the starter kit is it natural or synthetic brushes, or is it a mix? For the starter kit that I usually give my students, it's synthetic brushes. And I will I will have the ones that I usually include linked in that email later. Okay. They're very inexpensive, but they're great. I still use them myself um, for, for certain things. So perfect. Great Thank question. you. Mm 
-hmm. And then Raina asked for someone with arthritic hands, what brand is easy to hold and use? Oh gosh, good question. I don't know if I'm qualified to answer that question, to be honest. Um, I, I don't know if, if there are brushes that are specifically made for, for that. We can, Leanna, you know what we can do is take this question away um, and we can do some research on our own, certainly yeah. publish in the, you in the email. What? That's a great, a great idea, Nicole. Um, okay. One thing you might try is just to get it like one of those pencil grips that you can, you know, the squishy little grips and maybe put it on your brush and mm -hmm. that will make it wider to hold. Um, I would try that. That would be my first thought. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. Well, we can certainly, yeah. we can certainly post some of those little grips like you're suggesting. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. They're then, really inexpensive. Okay. That's, that's a great idea. And then we'll certainly do some research on actual equipment. And yes. then Alyssa, Alyssa asked thoughts on liquid paint. Oh, do you mean, um, like, I know there are liquid inks. Um, I haven't seen, gosh, is there liquid watercolor? I don't know. <laughs> you know what? Why don't, Alyssa, why don't you, if you want to be more specific, I think yeah. you're unmuted if you want to. Yeah, yeah. I just, um, when I first started doing watercolors, I had found a website that did classes and that's what they sell was the liquid watercolor paint. So that's kind of all I've ever used. Oh, um, so yeah, that's what Is I'm it more like, comfortable with. But it's like sure. a little tube of, of, of liquid paint. It's pretty, um, you know, it's not thick, but it's, it's not solid, hard paint, like, like you have in yeah. your tray. Okay. But, um, if you, if you've never used it, it's all good. No worries. <laughs> yeah. It's I'll have to look that up. I mean, the watercolor tubes that I use, these are liquid too. I mean, they're, um, very thick liquid. And then when I put it into the tray, it dries, but then I reactivate it. So it kind of stays liquid in the tube. And then, um, do yours stay liquid all the time? Essentially? Yeah. They're just like in a yeah. little jar. Um, oh yeah. Interesting. Okay. And that's, that's really neat because I guess, you know, you don't have to add water to start with. You can just yeah. go right in there. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's great to know about. I learned something new. I didn't know much about this. Awesome. Um, well, so. I want to try your, your, your style as well. <laughs> hey, I mean, that's the thing. It's so good to experiment and just try different things and see what you like. Um, you know, different artists have all different ways of doing it. There's not one way. <laughs> so I'm really glad you brought that up. Um, so yeah, paints are just so fascinating. I, um, even though, you know, of course now I'm, I do this for a living, I still keep a very limited supply of paint. I honestly, it's a little overwhelming when you go to like a paint website and they have hundreds of colors. So I wanted to just quickly share the ones that I use and, you know, not all of them, but I actually started with a brand called Holbein, H-O-L-B-E-I-N. And they have a starter pack that I think has maybe 10 colors. That is literally pretty much what I use <laughs> still. And I've, I've um, gotten a few new ones since then, but yeah, just blue, a few blues and greens, um, a yellow, a couple different yellows, cadmium and lemon, and, um, and then a, a red, a crimson lake. And then I have white and black as well, and then a couple of browns. And so really with these colors, you can mix almost anything you want. <laughs> so there's of course um, certain hues that you can get that you would not be able to mix with this. Um, but I would say getting a starter set to begin with is a great way to go because it limits your options. You can just work with that you can see how they mix and if you like it or not, and then you can pick out certain colors you wanna to add to your collection. Um, one that I want to share about, this is a, a company called Daniel Smith. 
It's called Moon Glow. And it's just this really gorgeous, deep purple color. And um, it's a granulating pigment. And I won't get too much into that, but, it, but basically a granulating pigment, um, it has bigger chunks of the, the ground up pigment in it. So it creates this beautiful texture when you paint. Um, it's really wonderful for natural elements like rocks, um, things like that. So anyway, this is a newer one for me, but I really love it. And I will say Daniel Smith watercolor is kind of like the ultimate, I, in my opinion, they're, they're really beautiful paints. So I've started adding more of those into my collection just slowly over time. Um, yeah, I think I saw a question pop up. Let's see. It's from Marcy. Marcy okay. Asked, you have a, a favorite website you order from. Yeah, I do. Um, a lot of the, the links that I'll have in our email will go to this site. It's called blick.com. You've, you've maybe heard of it. They have some in-person stores as well, uh, but their prices are really, really good. And, um, I pretty much order most of my supplies through them. Sometimes Amazon too, it just depends, but that's my go-to. Yeah, really good is question. Is it B-L-I-P, Leanna? I'm sorry, Blick. It's uh, B-L-I-C-K. Perfect, thank you. I'm putting it in the chat yeah. as well. Great, thanks, Nicole. Yeah, yeah, so they, they have all these supplies that I've just been sharing about, yeah. Okay. Well, are there any other questions about paints? Again, this could be its own class. I mean, there's just each paint has its own special kind of combination of things, you know, but, um, but yeah, to get started, a simple pan set is really what I would recommend. It just, you can do almost anything you want to with something like this. All right. Well, the last, of course, uh, tool that we use as a watercolor artist is the paper. We don't paint on canvas, although there is uh, a product called Watercolor Canvas. I have not tried it. Uh, it would be fun to experiment with. It's, it's on a panel, kind of like you would have a normal canvas, but it's formulated to accept more water. Um, so it sounds really interesting, but I've never tried it. I always work on paper. And watercolor paper is typically made um, out of cotton. At least the ones uh, like professional grade is, is usually 100% cotton. And it's, it's very strong, very absorbent. And so uh, the brand that I love to use is called Arches. And actually, I was watching a video on it this morning, and I it's not actually pronounced arches. That's just what we think it is. It's arch or something. <laughs> it's a French brand, but um, arches, that's what I call it. And it is it is fantastic. I would say if if there's any supply that you're gonna put a little money towards, the paper. The paper is the one to spend on. Brushes and paint, you can go way more um, inexpensive, but paper makes the biggest difference. So Arch, Arches is the brand that I really love, and I typically buy it in a large sheet. Um, I'll show you. Here we go. So what I'll do is um, get it in a large sheet, and actually this has already been broken down, but the neat thing is to, to tear it down and make smaller pieces, you can just use a straight edge like this and, and hold it down and tear it into whatever size you want. So I, uh, they usually come in 22 by 30 and you can actually get this brand arches at Hobby Lobby um, as well and probably Michael's. And, you know, it is a little pricey. I think a single sheet is like $8, but, um, you know, you can make like eight, eight by tens out of it or something like that. So um, that's what I typically do. So uh, 
yeah, the, the, the paper, um, the other thing to look for, you know, if you don't want to invest yet in this fancy paper, which, you know, this is kind of like, if you just want to get to the next level with it, there are really good student level uh, papers as well. The main thing you want to look for is 140 pound weight. And that's the, that's going to be the thickness of the paper. Anything less than that is going to more easily warp as you paint. So um, most, most standard watercolor sketchbooks and pads will be that weight. I just wanted to note that. Um, yeah, it's actually 140 pound. Yeah, 140 pound. And the other form that watercolor paper comes in, which is, is really lovely, is called a block and I'll show you one. Um, here is a block and this, this looks like a sketchbook, but it's actually sealed on all the edges. And so as you're working, it keeps your paper really nice and flat. And so, um, you know, you can just have, I've started on this one, you can just keep a really smooth surface as you're working. And then when you're finished, you can um, just put a little knife under, there's a little slot here and just work your way around and tear the paper off. So um, yeah, blocks are really wonderful. I like to use them for work that is not very water heavy. So like a botanical piece like this, um, I'm not filling the whole paper with water like I would for a landscape. Um, and so with this amount of water, it stays nice and flat. But if I'm gonna be using a lot of water on a page, I'm not gonna fully demonstrate this. I just wanna talk through it. Um, what I would do is a process called stretching the paper. And uh, let me get this here. Uh, okay, so stretching the paper is essentially getting the paper completely wet and um, like, dipping it into a tub or using a big brush to get the paper fully, fully wet, and then attaching it to a hard surface. And what I use to stretch paper with is um, a product called Gator Foam Board. And I'll have a link to this too. It looks like foam board. And so it's very lightweight, but it's extremely sturdy. It's like, you cannot bend this. It's very, very strong. And so it comes in large sheets, you can cut it down. And um, once my paper is fully wet, I use a staple gun and I staple it to this board. And the neat thing is once the, um, the, the paper dries, essentially the water is stretching out the paper, the fibers of the paper. And so once it dries, it's gonna stay, those fibers are gonna stay stretched out and locked in that position so that even when you go and put a lot of water on your paper, it's, it's not going to bend and warp. It's gonna stay flat. Whereas if you don't stretch the paper and you use a lot of water, you know, the fibers are like this, they stretch out when they get wet, but then they're gonna dry back to that when you get it wet. So, um, it's a little bit of a step, but honestly, um, once you get into the habit of it, it it's just so lovely to paint on stretched paper. <laughs> and um, I might even have a link to a video I've done on it and I'll try to find that Nicole and I can send that as well. Cause it, it really, it's, it's just so helpful. So that's such a great, that's such a great tip because as I've even watercolored, I'm like, why is this warping? So this, it, I mean, it makes, it, yeah. it makes perfect sense. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, do I stretch paper for each project? Oh yeah. That's a great question. Okay. So what I typically do, this is just my own little kind of weird method. <laughs> um, I have some gator board sheets, uh, that are pretty long. And what it does is it fits essentially two 11 by 14s, um, you know, on the size that I have it. So I'll stretch a paper that can 
fit two 11 by 14s. And then I'll just kind of tape off the area, work on that, do my other page, and then remove it from the board. So I like to kind of stretch a piece and then do a couple paintings on it instead of stretching each individual one. But there's nothing wrong with either way. Uh, for me, it just saves a little time to do it that way. Um, but you do need a bigger board to work on. So, and do they sell it pre-stretched? The closest you're gonna come to that is the watercolor block that I showed you. Um, I, some of them claim to be pre-stretched, but I have found that they still tend to warp a little bit even when they say that. So um, yeah, I, I would recommend stretching it kind of regardless. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So it's not, uh, it's the term stretching is kind of deceiving. You're not really making it bigger. You're just kind of um, expanding the fibers with water. So those stretch out and then locking them into place by securing it to a board. So kind of like, you know, if you're working with canvas, you stretch the canvas on stretcher bars. It's a similar concept, sort of. Um, you're not really making it bigger, but you're just like locking it into place. Yeah, good question, Linda. Yeah, so that was like a whirlwind overview <laughs> of, of supplies. Um, I thought I would take just a minute to show, if you wanna just jump in and maybe you've never done watercolor before, uh, just a fun and effective method to play with that leads to good results pretty quickly um, is if you have a waterproof pen and um, they come all different brands. Micron is one brand. This is Unipen. Um, you can do a drawing, you know, of anything. Let's say you're making a little card or something. Um, you can do a, just a, a lovely drawing and maybe you're, you're already kind of more confident with drawing uh, and the painting is still a little, a little tricky. The nice thing about a pen is that it gives you some good, like a good foundation for your piece. And then you can simply add some color to it. And even if it's loose and wiggly, you know, I can even go outside of the lines a little bit, but that doesn't matter. The, the pen, um, and once it's fully dry, I think I went a little quickly there, but the pen will stay in place and then you can just work around it. So that is just a really fun tip to play with. It's great for sketching. Um, I used to do a lot of architectural sketching, like when I traveled and stuff, I would draw buildings and you can just do quickly add pops of color into a beautiful line sketch by using this method. So um, this is just a really fun one to play with and it, it's just very forgiving. <laughs> so, um, so that's one that I love to show. Um, if you want to, if you want to start just playing with how watercolor moves and works, um, it's really a, a fun idea to just start with one color and see what you can paint with one color. Uh, I have found that when working with just a single color, it's a little more forgiving because you don't even have to worry about layering and stuff like that because it's just the same color. So um, blue is a really lovely color to start with, a dark blue, a uh, Prussian blue. You can do just, you know, little, little sketches with it, um, quick little botanicals, uh, and just kind of quickly put, put some elements together just with the same color. So this is, this is just a fun, Fun way to start before getting overwhelmed with color and things like that. Um, so you know, we've got we've got two questions here. What is a good use for white watercolor? Ooh, that is a great question. Oh, I'm so glad you brought that up. Okay, 
white in watercolor is primarily used for mixing. And the white that comes in most watercolor sets is opaque. So it, it's not as transparent as your regular watercolors. It actually has a little more thickness to it. So what you can do with your white is you can add it to any color you want. If you wanna make it a little more pastel and also just a little bit thicker. Um, so like I can mix up my white here and I've already got a little pinkish color mixed up here. It's going to, of course, lighten that color, but it's also going to make it a little creamier. I don't know how else to put it. It's just sort of like, um, not as, not as thin. It, it kind of thickens it up a little bit. And so, yeah, you can, you can just get some neat variations of your color with white whereas you know the pink that is straight out of the palette here is much it's much brighter so it, it kind of neutralizes the color a little bit and softens it but um you cannot even though it does say opaque you still can't really go over other colors with it it still is going to just kind of bleed into the background or you know not show up so on that note, I will, I will share one thing I do like to have on hand, um, or two things I, I should say. Let's see. One is um, this product here. It's called Dr. Martin's pH white and, or bleed, bleed proof white. This is, this is completely opaque. So it's really fantastic if you want to put little you know, white flowers over green grass or something like that, at the end of your painting, this will go right over top and do that. Um, a similar idea to that is to use a product called gouache. And um, actually, this is my watercolor. Let's see here. Gouache. Gouache is a sister to watercolor, essentially. It's really popular with illustrators and it is opaque. So it's almost like if you were to merge acrylic and watercolor together, kind of. Um, it's its own thing, but it's completely water soluble, just like watercolor. And they just pair really well together. So gouache will go over a dark color. Um, so that's, that's where if you want to paint that way, having one of these on hand is helpful. Yeah, that's fantastic. There's, there's, there's two more questions. One from Cindy. Um, okay. She, she says she's, she's not done a lot of sketching in, in years. And so should she focus yeah. first on her sketching? Cindy, I'm so glad you brought that up. I think that is a fabulous place to start. Um, sketching, there are just so many benefits to it. And having a regular sketching practice, even for myself, is still kind of the foundation of my art practice. It's so tempting to wanna to just jump right in and start painting right away. But sketching, um, the way that I was taught about it and I still love it, it connects your eye with your hand. And so it's like, you're able to translate what you're seeing through your hand and understand it better through the process of sketching. So it even helps you see better as you start to, you know, try to draw the objects in front of you. So yeah, I would say um, start with sketching even, um, yeah. And, and you don't have to get to like a certain level or something before you start painting, but sketching with just pencil is a great place to start first. Yeah, it's a wonderful foundation. And speaking of pencils, actually very good segue. Um, oh. a question here. Have you ever used watercolor pencils? I am so glad you mentioned that because I actually had it here as something I wanted to show you guys. Yes, I love watercolor pencils and I'll just tell you what I use them for. You can use them to actually, um, you know, shade and draw and color. Basically a watercolor pencil goes on just like a watercolor pencil, but it dissolves and gets, um, fluid with water. 
so it will blend just like paint once it's on the page and you put water on it. So that is lovely. And you know, that could be a good way to transition from just regular sketching into watercolor, maybe switch to a watercolor pencil and play with adding water to that. What I mainly use pencils for though, um, in my own practice is to lay down the initial sketch of my painting. Because the, the really lovely thing is, you know, I can sketch out um, a design here, but once I go over top of it with my paint, it will essentially disappear into the paint. So um, one challenge sometimes with watercolor is if you were to, you know, start with regular pencil and do your sketch that way, it's very easy for it to show through um, the paint. But with watercolor pencil, you know, I can go in here and it's going to pretty well disappear as I kind of rub my paint over it. Now, um, I usually do a little bit of a lighter pencil than the one I just used to do this phase. But um, yeah, I use them all the time for this sort of thing. Great question. And Leanna, there's another one here. Does the finished painting get sealed with something so it doesn't get ruined? Great question. Great question. Okay, so the answer is it can, but it doesn't have to. So usually, um, you know, traditionally watercolor artwork is framed with glass and the glass kind of serves as the protector for the paper. But um, if you don't want to frame it or you just want to display it a different way, I'll show you what I use for that. Um, let's see if I can find it. Here we go. Okay. There's a product here, um, UV Archival Varnish by Krylon. And this will just put, put, put a protective even UV resistant coating on your paper. So I've actually, I'll sometimes frame my work in a way where I um, kind of uh, uh, adhere it to a wood block and then like frame it almost like you would a canvas piece. So the paper remains exposed. And in that situation, I use this to protect the painting. Um, and it's even, like slightly waterproof too. So it's it's really pretty, pretty cool. Um, it does, I would say it deepens your the colors of your painting slightly. So it, that's just something to keep in mind, but it does a really good job. So great question. Oh, and, and how do I adhere it to the... Yeah, okay. So Alyssa, that is kind of its own process. And I could even do a workshop on that sometime, but really quickly, um, let's see here. I use uh, this product. Um, usually I use a, a brand called Golden, but it's the same thing. It's a matte gel medium. And I apply this, it comes in and I, this is old. We'll see <laughs> what this looks like. Um, this comes in basically, a, it's just a very thick uh, paste kind of. And I apply it to the wood block with a palette knife and get it really nice and smooth. And then I put um, like wax paper. Let's see. <clears throat> I uh, place the, the painting on the board that's been coated with that gel, put it on there. Then I put a wax paper over top and use this roller, it's called a brayer, and just roll over top of it and it gets it really nice and flattened onto the wood block. Um, and then I'll trim away any paper that's extending past the edges of the block. Um, and then when that dries, I'll spray it with my varnish. So, yeah. Yeah, it's, it is really fun. Actually, I'll show you an example of it. One sec.
So um, this is what it looks like when it's framed and finished. It just, this is like the paper itself, but it's been sprayed. Uh, and so it's attached to this wood panel. And then it has this float frame that fits around it. So it's just a little bit of a different way to display your watercolor work. Um, it's not great for everything, but I like it for smaller pieces that have a lot of negative space. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you, Leanna. This has been so great. Oh gosh, guys, you're welcome. I know that was sort of a whirlwind, but yeah, we'll follow up with lots of links <laughs> for you guys to peruse Absolutely. your own supplies. And just to reiterate, don't feel like you need all the right supplies. You know, whatever you have to start with, it's all about experimenting and just building on that as you go. And you don't need all the fancy stuff right away. It took me years to gather all these supplies. So, um, yeah, yeah. So, fabulous. Thank you guys, thank you so much for being here this morning. I'll look forward to hopefully seeing you in future workshops as we get more into techniques this year. But I hope I hope that helps you get started. Yay, thanks, Leanna. And to your point, we will send out an email in the next 24 to 48 hours with links. And certainly yes. as you go through your own process, share with us. We love to see how it's going. Oh, yeah. Yes, please, please. Happy awesome. Saturday. Enjoy. Thank thanks, you. everybody. Thank you.